Hi, this is Privateer Station, and today we bring you day 679 of Russian invasion into Ukraine. As always, with former advisor to the office of the President of Ukraine, Lieutenant Colonel Alexei Rostovich, and Russian investigative journalist Yulia Latinina. Apologies for my voice. By the end of the day, this is how it sounds. It gets a bit rough. This is another long stream, so chances are you will notice a difference in voiceover somewhere down the middle. Sometimes we get questions directed at us ourselves, not at the material, and one of them recently was, who pays for the translations? This cannot all be a volunteer project. Well, imagine this, it is a volunteer project, and of course our members help us to continue working, and super thanks and other donations. Speaking of which, thank you, Bill, and today's thanks go to our two members who stick with us for over a year already. Olga Lewis and Daniel Smith. Thank you, guys. So, without further ado, let's deep dive into day 679. Enjoy. Good evening, this is Yulia Latin and Alexei Rostovich in the new year. Happy New Year, friends. Happy New Year. Please do not forget to subscribe to Alexei's channel, which is shown at the bottom under this stream, and of course to mine and to the privateer station that is translating that into English language. So I think the first stream in this coming year should first of all be summing it up and then projecting some things into the next year, but I could not walk by one of the news that Newsweek published that Washington is going to get rid of working Atacom's missiles instead of giving them to Ukraine. The source is Daniel Rice, ex-advisor to Zaluzhny and uh, general, retired General uh, Ben Hodges, who confirmed that Newsweek publication and confirmed the fact that the uh, United States is going to get rid of Atacom's missiles without transferring them to Ukraine. Alexei, how can you explain that? Well, the basic article to all that, to understand all that, was the article about CIA I think it was Arkin, right? It was Newsweek and Arkin who published that. Where they said that before the war, American government had struck a concealed agreement with Russian government that uh, Putin's regime can enter war and with Ukraine and do something there without spilling outside of the borders. If to, consume, to assume that it is correct, then all that falls into this trend. If this war is um, subject of an agreement between two powers, between Putin's administration and Biden's administration, what can be done, what, where the red lines lie, and Biden is not walking beyond the red lines. And that's for Ukrainian military infantry is pouring hundreds of gallons of blood on the field. This is why we so love the administration of Biden. I personally love it with uh, burning passion, right? I, right, I can imagine what kind of love is that, but and Yulia, to understand that, American budget, utilization of Atacom's missiles is a rather expensive activity. So they will essentially use American budget to do that. I don't know if they will add workplaces to do it, but they could have just transferred them to Ukraine so we could shoot them and utilize them in this fashion. Today, also in the news, North Korea started to give Russia ballistic missiles of a short range and in other news, by spring, Iran is estimated to start delivering some of the short to medium range ballistic missiles to Russia. And as an answer to this news, we have America disposing of Atacom's missiles and we still have not gotten new terrorists from Germany. All right, so before going back to Americans, let's go back to a couple more things that I wanted to ask you. I think they're important the results of 2023 and some prognosis for the coming 2024. And if you can allow me, I might start to save some time. I think people were too concentrated last year that Ukrainian army did not take Takmak, but now we see that Putin under Avdiivka had wasted almost all of his reserves. So does it mean that his plans for offensive during winter of 2024 are not realistic anymore and he cannot do anything and probably will not be able to do anything until his re-elections or reappointments in March and after that he might 
reconsider and do something else. And last year, there were two unsuccessful counteroffensive, one on Takmak by Ukraine and one on Avdiivka by Putin. And the third, I think, important thing, that if Putin was stopped near Kiev by American javelins, by Ukrainian military, of course, but they were armed with American javelins, then his plans to occupy South and Kharkov were disrupted by HIMARS. Again, Ukrainian military armed with HIMARS systems, but offensive near Avdiivka, even though we may consider that Ukraine used some of the South Korean 150 millimeter artillery shells to stop it, for the most part, it was still disrupted by Ukrainian drones. So in defensive warfare, Ukraine is becoming more capable to defend itself. All right, Yulia, let's, uh, I understood your idea, let's play with it. I could also add here, Alexei, that if Zaluzhny indeed followed politicians and continued to push towards Takmak, then he could have put himself in a similar position as Putin did near Avdiivka and just wasted extra resources. Well, okay, so we did try to make sure that our politicians would make decisions that are more adequate to the current situation. Now, speaking of what stopped Russian invasion, javelins and Enlo were vanishing number at that point. They were they helped, but they were not the main force stopping Russian invasion. Out of 10 Enlo's, so that you understand, only four to six would fire. And we actually had to set up a production of batteries for them because we were given them at the end of their shelf life at ninth year. So we were affixing special batteries to make sure they actually shoot. Then HIMARS during the Kharkov operation, no, they were not active there. They did not solve it. And they were mostly ground troops solving it. And Avdivka, it's again, mostly not artillery shells. It's the blood of our troops and uh, knowledge of our tankers and everybody who were defending that perch. So one needs to understand that the Russian army, when they entered Ukraine at the beginning of this war, they tried to fight by NATO standards. And they were thrown out of the Ukraine and they were defeated by pure Ukrainian military methods. Military aid from the West at that point was very non-existent. There was, thankfully, we had some javelins and enlows, but they were minimal numbers. The first Rammstein happened on the 26th of April. First serious aid came at the end of June. And how serious they were, the first shipments came. They were still too little, but uh, at least that's when we started getting some supplies. And Kharkov operation occurred in September, even though we did not get enough aid by that time. Whatever we received, we couldn't even calculate, you know, it, it wasn't even fully fulfilled what we were asking for. We had maybe 10% of what we asked, and that was what was represented on the front. So mostly it was Ukrainian military. And it's only Russian propaganda that thinks that is actually fighting actively with NATO here and they could not capture Ukraine only due to NATO. So we're still actually talking mostly about 152 millimeter caliber shells for the artillery. We do have some 155 NATO standard, but they are again not the driving force. It is not the all defining tool. Okay, I did want Alexei to outline the other part of what I said, that Putin faced, is facing now a huge problem because he spent so much reserves near Divka that doesn't allow him to realize his winter offensive. Okay, if we're taking a concept of two failed counteroffensives, then as both you and I discussed, and I can repeat it once again, that the most difficult part of military strategy and government politics is a transfer of political goals into military goals and then transfer back from military goals to political. That is a really sore point for most countries, even Clausewitz paid attention to that, even Sun Tzu thousands of years ago paid attention to that because military politicians, poorly military and politicians uh, do not quite understand each other well. Their understanding is rather poor and Whenever you actually create a proper transfer system, it includes people that can speak both languages, the language of military and the language of politicians, who can transfer and translate one from another. There were very few people who can do that. In the office of the president, there was just me who, did, who was doing it, who understands both politics and a bit in military, right? Just a little bit. 
So this is a very complex story and conclusions from 2023 for both countries should include understanding that politicians need to be kept a bit further away from the front, that military have to have their say. Remember in the Game of Thrones when Avaris is asking a question of Tyrion, if you watched it. He's my favorite author, by the way. Okay. So, yeah, it probably wasn't a book as well. But the question was about the priest, king, and merchant. And everybody offers gold to a soldier to kill two others. All right, Alexei, what is power? Aris is asking. The world is working very simply. The word rules the sword, the sword rules the gold, the gold rules everybody else. And that word, and that, however, ideology is silly, however simplified is it, this is the one that rules the sword. And now both here in Ukraine and over in Russia, they are hostages of the words that they use to describe their victories. We are running to the borders of 1991 and they are demilitarizing, denazifying and trying to control Ukraine. And military on both sides cannot fulfill these tasks, not because they are so dumb, but because they were never preparing for the big war. Russian military were preparing for a small military, a small police operation after Georgia, and they cannot conduct any single operation of the operative level. Comrade Stalin, however infernal figure he is, he was conducting three strategic offensives in one year, strategic level offensives, mother darling. And here, even a smaller one, you cannot, uh, they cannot fulfill on the front. We can probably count liberation of the right bank from occupants uh, as a big operative success, but that's about it. And yeah, we were also not preparing for any of that. We were preparing to go to war, to do democracy, elections and all that. And now we find ourselves fighting the biggest war after the Second World War in Europe and the biggest uh, after Iran-Iraq war, right? And none of the sides is succeeding. So politicians need to realize the limitations of it because they're setting up those brave goals as if on both sides they had fronts with military, well-trained, well-equipped, and everybody is getting new millions of shells, millions of people, but this is not so, and they cannot acknowledge that. And that means that Potsdam Yalta system is not in the documents, in their heads. When we speak about the big war, what is the first thing that they remember, both Russians and Ukrainians? Right, exactly, Second World War. Right. This is the example we have for the big war, because everything else uh, just doesn't meet the goal, doesn't meet the rating. Afghan, Chechen, Georgian war, none of them was big enough. So this operation, or special operation, however you call it, or liberation war, however we call it, and now all the politicians are using the same rhetoric that was used back in the Second World War, and the main argument between two parties now, two sides of this war, is who is the real fascist, right? Because it's very much reminiscent of the Second World War, what's happening on the front, the, with the only difference of FPV drones and some radio interference. That's about it. All the rhetoric on the politicians is in the framework of Second World War. What do our politicians say? Complete capitulation, separation of Russia, borders of 1991 and on Russian side they're basically picking this up and saying borders of 1991 right let's just pick the earlier borders of the Soviet Union so we'll go all the way to Lvov to the west of Ukraine and these are the politicians motivating military how to hold the sword and our military need to make the right conclusions. And our military made, I think, the right ones. Zaluzhny published an article in autumn saying, this is what we can do from here to here. Anything beyond is unattainable. And if you want us to achieve that, you need to reconsider arming us differently. 
And I'm not sure if they even pushed any like that narrative in Russia, but the goals they have to capture Lugansk and Donetsk republics are completely unattainable for them in their current way, current level of equipment and resource. This war is rather funny from this angle, because both sides use very pathos rhetoric, and the real capabilities are to fight for four or six months for very small towns like Avdivka, which during the Second World War were captured by dozens daily during big strategic operations. Well, there were some there were some things that were being captured for half a year, right, before they fell. Small Ukrainian sold uh, villages, right, with 6,000 of Russian names on a monument that they wasted to liberate that the whole division. So, yeah, there were different examples, but still. And my message here is that politicians need to be more modest in their rhetoric. If they will try to tailor their words to meet the reality, then all of a sudden they'll figure out that there'll be no separation of Russia and there'll be no denazification of Ukraine. And what will be, will be heroically won battle for Avdivka. And now Zelensky probably needs to go out and say, we conscribe half a million people to and now let's listen to the word that he will say, right? To not give up Avdivka. For example, to defend Chesov Yar, and people start thinking, you think, well, the goal is good, but half a million, and Putin mobilizing his, what will he say? Will denazify everybody in Ukraine in Avdivka to the street or to the northern street because that's how they count their captures in Avdivka by houses, right? So they can report about capturing the west side of Kanatna Street, and these are their Ministry of Defense level reporting, right, of one of the biggest nuclear countries in the world that they've taken Mariinka finally after you want to say probably 10 years of fighting since the first incident and two years of very intensive fighting. This is definitely an achievement. And right, I don't, I very sincerely doubt that Russian citizens want to conscribe to military and go fighting for any of that. So they are in a trap of their rhetoric and the West is also in a trap because on one hand they are talking about democracy and values that they need to support and on the, with the other hand they are sending HIMARS missiles instead of Ukraine into a utilizer to dismantle and disassemble. This is a modern world for you, this is modern politics. So, do I understand it correct, Alexei, that both sides will be fighting in trenches? On one side will be half a million, the other side will have half a million for Avdiivka and Marinka. Yeah, something like that will be happening, unless there'll be some black swans. And speaking of big breakthroughs, imagine we got 50 F-16s and we used them on a small part of the front, we bombed everything 15 kilometers wide and 10 kilometers deep. Okay, we have a pocket. And after that, yeah, pocket like near Takmak. And then after that, it's infantry that will be resolving the situation because they'll be sitting in trenches, sending FPV drones on each other's heads, shooting the artillery as usual because we'll probably figure out that some bombs that would be supplied to F-16s were actually disassembled and dismantled and taken off service by our allies. By the way, in the comments I'm reading, people are very upset that before you've been telling that Ukraine will win and now you're saying these pessimistic statements. So, in relation to that, I have a question. Why? does the change of what person is saying about reality, not even conviction and philosophy or anything, but just description of reality as it changes. In the modern politicized world, the expectations that were put so high up on the Christmas tree by politicians, when situation changes and, for example, summer is gone and now it's winter and politician is saying, well, we've been walking in flip-flops, now we need to put the warmer shoes on. And he gets a blowback from audience that, look, he's such a scumbag, he's changing what he's talking about. 
I think this is a very interesting moment that characterizes the mood of the society, on both sides actually, in Russia and in Ukraine. When I always thought that we have our brains to reflect reality, right, to help us understand reality. And apparently for some people, they use their brains to defy reality. All right, Julia, if we are walking on that high philosophic level, I'll try to name the real cause of what's happening. There are two categories of people in the world. Some people believe that matter defines beingness. Others believe that consciousness, beingness, defines matter. I believe the latter, and they believe the former. And that's their problem. I will tell you a Buddhist story. In this regard, there was a monastery far away in the mountains. There were 20 disciples and a teacher living there. And one day he called upon them and said, you know, I deceived you. I'm not a teacher. You will not, never be enlightened. I'm just a thief who ran away from the powers, came here so far in the mountains, said that I'm a great teacher. Locals built a good monastery and previous students helped me to build the monastery. And I'm sitting here, I cannot really go down for fear of being captured. And to you, I'm just telling all the things that somewhat sound deep and you believe in it. There'll be no enlightenment. I don't believe in any of that, that I'm telling you. They started crying, they called him the last words and left. One of them returned halfway through and came back to the monastery and said, you know, perhaps you're a thief and you're not a teacher, but I'm rather used to that. I like the environment. And here he got enlightened. And everybody else were following other roads without any enlightenment. I like all these turns in my rhetoric because I am always curious to see who remains. Most people, they're not even mops for cleaning floors. They're like wet paper towel, wet toilet paper. Whenever you pull on them, they completely crumble. But I do notice that regardless of what's happening there in my surroundings, there are always a group of people who just say, no, disregard. We have our goals and we continue walking. Disregard everything else. And that's it. Okay, since we're talking about all these topics, I have another question. You said that one people will be fighting against the others in trenches, there'll be tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands dead. If Soviet Union wasn't collapsed, didn't collapse, could we even imagine that? Was it a good thing or a bad thing that Soviet Union disappeared off the political map? Yulia, I think this is a very big topic. And we can also say that it did not dissolve by itself. There was a decision to dismantle it by people in power who wanted to convert their power into property and to be not so responsible for that process. That's why the national borders were brought up, up front. And I want to say that most of communists actually voted for leaving Soviet Union here in Ukraine. So communists brought us independence. And Leonid Kuchma, ex-head of Central Ukrainian Communist Party Committee, who was always going in his life by the political line, and all his uh, biography is a testament to that. But uh, he and his were the ones who voted for separation. And I think these people made a big mistake at some point. They failed to understand that property without power costs nothing. This is speaking of the question, returning back to that, who runs whom? Because you can be a billionaire, but then there'll be a Sergeant Petrenka who came over, put a lock on your company, and you're out of business. They tried to change power for property, and now they're understanding that life is more complex than that. And when Americans will probably uh, not give them enough or take away some of their money, they might become a little wiser, maybe not. When you said it was dismantled in regards to Soviet Union, it is an important point here. And very often people use that to accuse CIA or some other foreign actors in dismantling that. But as you said, and I will follow on that, the same nomenclature of Soviet Union that were building their careers on the party lines inside, in a difficult moment, 
when instead of taking responsibility and blame for mistakes they made, they decided to go for converting their power to money. There was not so much a desire for democracy, but there was a there were local actors like a local head of Central Committee of Communist Power who said, oh, okay, now I can have money. Remember the case of uh, Gdlan and Ivanov about Uzbek Mafia? For those who don't remember, the leadership of Communist Party in Uzbekistan had illegal plantations where they were harvesting cotton and other materials and they were exploiting pioneers and come and come some all and other resources illegally they were uh, brought into the justice system my uncle one of was the judge presiding over the case and he was often thrown on the most difficult cases like chain of uh, stores ocean where there was a billion dollar worth of uh, thievery blooming and um, he participated in all of these uh, difficult ones so party mafia in all the republics was afraid was scared for their lives after that case because who is a communist leader of the party in the republic he is god basically he is vice god in this area but then they got scared andropov scared them and everybody else who looked into the spot and they decided to split in their national quarters but baltic countries we have to mention is a different story right baltic countries is a bit different we're not talking about latvia but other national suburbs right what uh, was sung in the anthem of Soviet Union. The Union was joined by the great Russia, and the, the Union, the initial core, was Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine. So that trifecta was holding the whole system. And when the Soviet Union was falling apart, if you noticed, there were no other leaders. There was no Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan leaders present uh, signing that uh, agreement. It was Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia. And remember the days when Bush and Margaret Thatcher came over and said to not leave the Soviet Union. They were thinking about something, right, before coming and visiting and trying to persuade republics to not fall apart from the USSR. And the communists were telling the president of the United States that they are eager to break Soviet Union apart, and the President of the United States was saying that please do not do that. This is a short-sighted. So interesting story that many people have forgotten about. So going back to Putin's wish to try to revive that, or probably mostly just to annex Ukraine rather than that. And as we talked that the disintegration of Soviet Union was not necessarily uh, one colored beautiful thing it was a mixed gray event and it was also not predetermined so it is worth noting that putin's attack on ukraine was a consequence of him turning russia into a scarecrow because what happened happened right we're not for rebuilding humpty dumpty but if Russia was a prosperous country with growing economy, it doesn't even have to be democratic, China is not democratic, then there would not be, how should I put that, there would not be neither economic or any other reasoning to push too far apart, because the same program of mononational Ukraine, like Faryon and her nationalists, uh, get maybe 5% in the parliament. There is Russia that is a big part of the West, not that it shares all the values, but in regards that it's economic partner of the West. And there is a law of economic gravity that it is better to, and I'm looking forwards here trying to explain that, if you divorced your previous husband, if he is a billionaire, will probably remain in good relations between each other. But if uh, the person is a drunk and has no money and chasing his wife with an ex, then probably relations will be bad. All right, Yulia. Um, Russia started that, not even under Putin, that conflict, but under Yeltsin. No, I think they started, I, my thesis is that they started under Putin because they actually started falling backwards in terms of economy. Okay, no, no, no. Let's uh, look back at Mishkovshina and the separation of the Black Sea Fleet. That similar story about bringing military retirees, creating paramilitary organizations, giving Russian passports, almost got to the war level in Crimea. It culminated in putting mines and explosive devices on the ships of the fleet. And National Guard was created in Crimea to win the battles of patrols. 
And then Russia gave a reason for sharp growth of nationalistic moods in Ukraine. And that's when the mono-ethnic Ukraine project became part of the political spectrum. If that didn't exist, I don't think it would even have any chances, because such a marginalized conversation could only exist in such a society as Ukraine was, um, very cultured, very high level of income country compared to other USSR countries. Um, it was done, that started under Yeltsin. So, you know, early on, people were friendly, republics were still working with each other, they were shooting movies in different co-locations. And then there was a gas war, right? Then there was Tuzla, then Miskovshina, and cold winters, right? When they were turning the gas off, then there was Georgia. And then after Maidan, they make a decision about creating, a, starting a historic operation against Ukraine with the goal of its annexation. I was in February of 2005 in Moscow. I've seen how it was unfolding. I went there to understand their rhetoric and what goals they have. So they were adopting in 2005 the project on annexation of Ukraine. And the economy was still intertwined and was going deeper. There was a lot of artistic collaboration, and they were already preparing that operation. As a result, we lost Crimea. Minister of Defense was a citizen of Russia, Minister of Police of Internal Affairs was a citizen of Russia, Ministry of Enforcement Agency was also the, the citizen of Russia. And they succeeded in taking Crimea, then they also took Donbass, and that all came to 2022. This is their side of the question. They were always aggressive, they always wanted Let's be blunt here, they always wanted evil for Ukraine. And, of course, their economy was wavering back and forth. They were setting a big experiment of surviving without any major ideology during all the time. And let's take Ukrainian side. Our responsibility is also huge in this conflict. While we were strong, we won the Crimean conflict with Mishkovshina. We won that over the Black Sea fleet. We also won Tuzla issue, because Kuchma, the army that he was holding there in that area, was much stronger than what Russia could bring. And Russia was also tied in with Chechen war, so that was the only reason why Putin backed off. But then during Yushchenko, the main nationalist, the main ideologist of moving Ukraine towards NATO, and our glorious Ministry of uh, Defense, whatever his name was during his times, under him we wasted and sold and drained down the toilet a lot of our military capacity. And our motion to 2014 that turned us face, our face to Europe and our back to Russia, we met very unprepared. Army was basically a collection of bombs. I remember near Slavyansk when a column of armored vehicles were powering from a single accumulator, single battery that was working, and it took them an hour and a half to start all of them. And in those days when somebody gave a gift of good running shoes to a military, that was a fantastic present. Or if you somehow got a red dot site that was equal to pretty much being declared a hero of Ukraine. And our responsibility was that we were screaming that we are going to European Union and NATO, and the price to pay for that was a big war with Russia, and we were not preparing for that war. So we were behaving as a historic food in this sense. And our main ideological idea became to basically exclude ourselves from history. And how do you exclude yourself? You just disappear and don't take any responsibility for your politics. You join some other bigger group like European Union or NATO. Before Moscow was making all decisions for us, now let's make sure Washington and Brussels would be making decisions for us. And we basically did everything to be attacked. The main responsibility for attacking is on Kremlin, on Putin, but we did everything to make it easy for him to attack us. All right, let me interject here. Putin had to think that if he is leaving Europe, he will be losing Ukraine. And if he puts Khodorkovsky in jail and turns Russian business from a very strong economic machine, as it was early on, into a group of oligarchs who will be just funding him so he would not touch them, 
and wow. then he would have to annex Ukraine. That's what he had to choose. Choose. I don't think he was thinking in categories of Ukraine at that point. The categories in Russia at that point was uh, they were thinking in was uh, Western, pretty Western liberalism. Their economy was uh, much stronger than U Ukrainian. It was more liberal than Ukrainian, but that liberalism was run by ex-KGB people, and that hybrid ideology was formulated as a result, and that's what they put on their banners. And it took them a long time to understand, to really understand the and work out the system of relations between themselves and Ukraine, with the West, and they're not even fully at this understanding yet, I would say. And they're just starting at this point to get there after wasting hundreds of thousands of people on the front. And now they're starting to build some sort of ideology. We may not like that vector, but at least they have a vector of ideology now starting to emerge. Until then, there was just walking in all different directions. And Putin for a long time was one of the most pro-Western politicians. He was Germanophile, he was Americophile. He was the first person who called Bush after the 9-11, right? Tony Blair or anybody else haven't reached him, and Putin already was on the phone offering his aid. And they had American base on the territory of Russia. Oh yeah, but he had a serious story behind that. He actually did mention that there were some terrorists hiding in Pankis Valley, and it actually there was recorded a phone call from, I think, Saudi Arabia to that uh, area, or from Afghanistan to that area. So there was actually a piece of truth why he was calling. And yeah, he also was invited to Bush's ranch, where not everybody is. And he had a very good honeymoon with the G7 to make a G8. But then something failed, and he had a Munich speech and Georgia war. And Russia was wavering as a drunk back and forth. And it's difficult to accuse them that they were conducting a solidified politics during that time. The only line that you can see is that they were breaking down all the opposition, all the political opposition within Russia. And they also were trying to deal with Ukraine as competitor on a post-Soviet space. And to figure out some sort of relations between the West and Russia. And to determine the level of social contract they need to have, how much pensions and salaries they need to pay. So these things they were basically working on during that time. Everything else was very ill-defined. There is still not defining a lot of elements but at least now they have some vectors. So, they are guilty, but we are responsible. They are guilty for starting this war, and we are responsible for not being prepared. All right, then I continue the evening of improper questions. I have one more. As you said, the West is sleeping. It's in a dementia stage, or not even waking up to that war. I have a question in this regard. 1772, Catherine the Great brings her troops into Poland, and here Prussia and Austro-Hungary start to aid Poles, basically giving them all kind of munitions, the old times, HIMARS and 3-axis or whatever the cannons were called back then. So this I'm bringing up that in the 19th century, and earlier, Europe would be gladly fighting against Russia in such a case, but in a different fashion that is being thought today that Europe would uh, aid Ukraine for free, because Poland would probably happily return Galicia back into its fold, and maybe even remember that in 1772 that was uh, territory was also being divided and it was called a split of Poland. Well, hey, we have a different example too, a Crimean War, Russian-Turkish War of 1877-78, when Russian uh, fleet was standing near Istanbul and sending hellos. Um, Kamchatka, attack on Crimea, expeditionary force that landed on the territory of Russian Empire, they actually were successful in doing it. You know, Kronstadt was being shelled, 
during those after the revolution times. So the West is asleep not because they haven't formed four international brigades with F-16s and they're not fighting for us, but because they don't know what they want from themselves, primarily. Not from Russia and Ukraine, they don't know what they want from themselves. They're, they're at a loss. We can look outside the window. Those people have no vision. They're somewhat on the verge of a big societal conflict here, and they're just willing to maybe pray to God and see what happens. Right? Now, United States are at the level when local states, individual states, try to hinder the whole country election process. And that could lead to an acceptance of the results and then probably a bigger conflict in the format of civil war one way or another. So, yeah, they're at a loss. Now, before we start talking about that, I'll talk about another thing. We keep hearing that United States, the United States are so dumb that Biden is asleep. They haven't figured out their fantastic chance of helping Ukraine and getting Ukraine on board. And there are a lot of articles in the Western media, American media specifically. We already mentioned the May article by Arkin in Newsweek that Ukraine is not following through agreements that Putin agreed with Burns about, whether they're good or bad, but that was an attempt to knock on the door and say, hey, there are some agreements that the elder partner of Ukraine promised, and Ukraine is not following these promises. Biden promised that there will not be hits on the territory of Russia, and then some Dugans get exploded in Russia, and something's falling out of that framework. There was another article by Susan Glasser in New Yorker in October. She was attacking Jake Sullivan. She's portraying him as a very indecisive person, what we talked about before. And she's saying a very peculiar story about Biden being categorically against Ukraine joining NATO. And he communicated that to Zelensky on many occasions that he went to Kiev to offer Zelensky an alternative, an alternative relation similar to what the United States has with Israel. And then Biden and Sullivan, despite of all that and in incongruous level of partnership, they still went along on the Vilnius summit. And then that communication between them, after which Sullivan was uh, turned red and Zelensky tweeted the statement that pissed everybody off. So all these articles, they're knocking on the same door. Guys, hello, you are completely dependent upon us over there in Ukraine, and you're not a team player. You want United States to be your magical partner and aid, but it's not how it works. United States always have its own interests. Well, no, it exists, right? Because we demonstrate that it actually sometimes worked differently. Ukraine is a, a country without a peculiar vector or specific vector, but we have enough stubbornness to not listen even to the United States in the key matters. And this is a weird push-pull relations when we're being told, hey, you're not doing this. And then we're saying, well, yeah, but we needed that and we just go and do it. So, of course, they're upset and they don't give us atoms as a result, but they still give us some tanks, some Abrams, and this is a weird relations and that's how it evolves. But I think our main mistake is a vector mistake. The fact that we cannot determine what do we want. We, and frankly speaking here, I don't know why should we knocking on the door with our head to the organization that doesn't want to accept us. There's nothing but putting yourself lower by doing that action. And that's a rhetoric question. Imagine, I'm going to visit you and Dasha as a, a guest, but you're telling me, no, we're good friends, but stay away, don't, don't knock on the door. And then I'm insisting I'm publishing tweets uh, and creating some social unrest and other things to push and to make sure that hey, I do want you to receive me, right? Why? 
So I'm trying to understand, Alexei, what is going on. And it feels like a big part of this war is public relations. And on one hand, President Zelensky, with the aid of that PR stunt, acquired more weapons than the West was ever going to give Ukraine. So that definitely is a strong part on his side. And he turned that war into the war of light and darkness and brought it pretty high up. On one hand, PR is good when it inspires. On the other hand, it's bad when it defies reality. And there are cases when the United States become really upset with, and I strongly suspect that that same Atacom's delay or not supplying certain nomenclature. That I was thinking that it's behavior of Ukrainian powers that led to some of these elements not being supplied on time and basically telling Ukraine, well, then go F yourself. You know, we were not going to give you enough aid because you're not listening to us. Like the PR about the borders of 91, fantastic proposition, right, for Ukraine? But because of, when because of that PR, the Ukraine is not digging fortified trenches and fortifications along the front lines. When Ukraine, because of that PR, essentially is wasting more people in fight instead of having them protected. And because of that, the proposition to mobilize the society also runs into certain obstacles because nobody wants to be participating in the meat storms. They want to be used smarter. So my question is, when PR is a plus and when it's a big demotivator because it starts to split away from reality, I can quote you the first page of the book on PSYOPs. It says, no operation can allow you to achieve your goals, your own motivation or demotivation of enemy, unless there are real actions behind them. You can invest $300 billion in public relations, you'll get temporary effects, and the proposition of price and quality will be very subpar. When there are real events unfolding, you sometimes don't even need to do any PR. The actions will speak louder than words. One of the Chinese proverbs, for me, it's one of the wisest on this planet. And it sounds like this. The hunter who is boasting at the body of the dead lion is to be despised. And the hunter who is boasting at the body of a lion defeated is to be praised. And what about the line, a drone line? Yeah, that's another version of it. Um, so Zelensky did not turn this war into the war of light and darkness. He managed to use the symbolic capital acquired by the whole people of Ukraine. He was the focal point of that capital, and he successfully converted that into the aid from the West. That was a good work. And it worked till about the liberation of Kherson. 11th of November, 22. After that, everything changed, and we needed to change our strategy. And I remember debates on this topic in the office. I remember them very keenly. But we had we had people also showing with numbers and everything. But we were not. We were overruled. We were not heard about the defense. Second, is that we're being punished about for some disobedience, right? We don't have direct proof of that. We can suspect it, but I can say that a much bigger framework are being imposed not by certain steps by Zelensky, but by a general agreement between, let's call them Biden administration and Putin administration. There are certain frames set there that preclude them from aiding us in certain ways, regardless of how Zelensky jumps and what he does. And we have the problem of our own vector. We're knocking on the closed doors, we're kicking and screaming to be led to the table where we are not invited, where we're not going to be held. And the fourth is that PR is good when, and we're going back to the beginning, when there are real actions behind it. You can demand aid from United States, shake your fist and saying that we're going and fighting for NATO and protecting all of you, 
and then on, at the same time saying that if you don't support us, we'll all die. A very typical psychological hysteria of a client who doesn't want to change, who comes to the consultation, and that's exactly what they usually, how they behave. When you tell them you need to drop these bad habits, then you see the approach twofold. One way is basically, please pity me, I cannot change myself. And then second, if you, if you don't, then I can't be responsible for myself, I'll go and write something bad about you. So this is known in psychology and probably can be transposed into geopsychology. So if we instead put a calculator between us and the West and we were offering very realistic programs, I think we would have more effect. I don't know how much, but I think it would be more effective. Because once again, I would remind Americans that the main words for our conversations are lithium and titanium. You mean lithium and titanium? Minerals? Yes, Ukrainian lithium and titanium. America is absolutely interested in these two. Titanium is what all the civilian and military planes are flying on in the United States. And they cannot be getting Russian after the beginning of war. They only have Ukrainian now left. And I don't see any conversation in this regard. But every conversation in the long term here in New York switches to conversation about titanium on the 15th minute of that conversation and strategy. But I'm not seeing that on the official field and the official negotiations. And have we managed to create a, a situation in the politics where we would foster and use their material interest in the Ukrainian victory? And if you think thoroughly about that, the answer will unfortunately be a no because PR is good only when it goes together hand in hand with real actions. Because if you're just using the symbolic stored capital, eventually you're not given atacums. And then you have to turn to your people and say, well, we need to mobilize and mobilize uh, half a million of you on the front. This is only because of lack of actions on the other part. And it's a similar way we treat our allies we relate to our own people. To our allies, we tell we're the right flank of NATO, support us or else. And internally, we're sending a message, the country is failing and we need to save it. But on neither side, we do not see, on, the, on both sides, we do not see any positive motivation. Because positive motivation is very important. And in societal relations, it turns out that they create a very restrictive law and then they remove some of the restrictions and that's all the positive motivations they can go for. Do you know the most Soviet type country after follow, following of USSR? The exact copy of USSR? You think Uzbekistan? No, it's Ukraine. All Soviet practices in federal management, all worst from Soviet management is right there. Oh, we can fight over that. I think in, in Russia we have just as much. I think we brotherly shared that equally. Yulia Beck, in the Soviet Union there was a saying that when in Moscow they trim nails in Kiev, they chop the fingers off. Because in Kiev, most of the communist decisions and social, so Soviet Union decisions were implemented much harsher than everywhere else. Kiev was like an exemplary workshop. And that's why in the end of the USSR, there were Ukrainians at a lot of key positions of the country, because they were most ideologically trustworthy. Alexei, can I interrupt you here and uh, tell a story that I cannot not tell? Okay, so in Ukraine, there is a person called Vadim Skorodovsky, whom you probably know, and whom at the end of 70s was actually facing jail time in Soviet Union because he was writing books in Ukrainian and in Soviet Union that was frowned upon. And he sent an article to Moscow, to a literature paper, where my mom was an editor at that time. Um, her last name was also Latina, and she printed it. She was a good uh, critic and she was a good editor. She saw it's a good article, so she printed second and third from him, and then Ukrainian KGB, the ones that were going to put him in jail. They eventually backed off him after the third publication because they started thinking that he has some protectors over in Moscow. 
even though his only protector in Moscow was Alla Latinina, my mother, who was allowing his articles to be printed. But they uh, took that as the back-off moment. Okay, so tell me another story, Yulia. When Khrushchev in 1956, when he needed to make peace with Ukrainian Liberation Army, remnants of, and he wanted to put it on his flag that he actually pacified them and, and uh, made them uh, join the Union without fighting back. So the first two negotiators whom he sent here were killed. So the first uh, two, basically, they they rolled grenades under their cars or in the, under their doors and they were assassinated. The third one came as a special agent. He was hiding his true identity. He was uh, eventually successful to establish the communication line, give guarantees back and uh, eventually signed everything with them and came to agreements that they would not be fighting back against the Soviet Union. So everything in Kiev was rather rough all the time. And I would say that in Dnipropetrovsk and in Kiev, party committees, they're probably the most stern party committees in the whole Soviet Union. That's why I brought this saying before, when they trim nails in Moscow, they chop fingers off in Ukraine. So why did they blow up those negotiators initially? Alexei, oh, they did not want to strike peace. It was still 55. The third of uh, Ministry of uh, Special Services were actually sitting in Ukraine. They were fighting with the Ukrainian Liberation Army that was still basically hiding and did maybe a couple actions during a year because uh, middle link were mostly killed, uh, jailed, and there were only old ones and the very young ones that are still operating. I talked, had a chance to talk to some of them, and many of them were basically Maoists. They were following the same route that Mao was trailblazing in China. The older KGB folks who lived there, who were working in Ukraine, uh, they actually were against that pacification either, because they were getting twice the speed for getting their rank, they were getting more money uh, working for KGB at that time, MGB, but they did not want to, because they were living in a good climate, in a good uh, place, and if there was no conflict in Ukraine, they would be spending their time sometime in Siberia, or over towards the north, or far east, they did not like it, so they were preventing from resolution of this conflict. So they liked the stars, right, and the rings, oh, absolutely, they did. So it was a complex system, and all Soviet practices, in the worst meaning of it, we can find here. If we had them in the best, we probably would have a million drones and missiles that are flying for a thousand kilometers. But we forgot those. We unfortunately kept the worst ones where reprimand is the only tool to motivate people and we forget the reward. And this is one of the collective deficiencies in our society. We have a lot, actually. You know what your story reminded me of? There was another story in a town called Lepsis Magna and the fourth age AD. So these bureaucrats that were running the town, they missed the invasion of uh, barbarians that were invading from that side and because they were stealing money. And they sent a letter, the citizens of the town, to Valentinian, the emperor of Roman Empire, to fix uh, things. So they sent a letter saying, hey, the, the barbarians robbed us and the bureaucrats didn't do anything. So he sends the inspections, and the inspectors got in intercepted by the bureaucrats, which tell them that there was there were no barbarians, and it, it's a completely invented story. So the town folks who wrote the initial appeal were executed, and what it ended with is that the city was eventually ransacked and overrun by the barbarians. Oh, you know, there is another fantastic story, Yulia, right, about uh, Pontius Pilate, how that decision about execution was made. Oh, Alexei, let's not go there. I have a whole book about how and why was he crucified. And it would be surprising to learn that some of the reasons were very similar to what were voiced uh, for assassination of bin Laden. But we also heard after that uh, same thing about peaceful Islam that we hear now, about peaceful Christianity back in the Roman Empire. I have um, another question closer to modern times. When you started talking about the worst Soviet practices, doesn't it seem to you, and I have a nagging thought, that besides a very obvious goal of holding Putin, if they even hold this as a goal, 
they have a secondary goal to hold Ukraine because Ukraine with these habits and the size that it is being helped by the West and Ukraine is saying yes we're going towards Europe it's a very understandable desire because Putin on the other hand is going to medieval times and some stone ages but we just mentioned Roman Empire and you know how Germans came to Roman Empire and said we want to serve Roman Empire just let us serve and give us a little bit of land to settle so very many people from Ukraine want to go join Europe and Europe starts I think more and more soberly really understand its capabilities and it figured out how to bring some countries before but they are, have concerns about their ability to intake Ukraine and for Ukraine this is an obvious result of war but for the West it's uh, a different goal I think they would rather keep the status quo well Yulia first I don't see their goal to hold Putin really I also do not quite think that he is taking his country to Middle Ages he is leading it to some very conservative project but not exactly medieval by the way speaking of medieval times in Grozny times in Russia a villager had supposedly more rights than a citizen of the United States these days because he would not be even given to the Tsar court without agreement of at least two different levels below that below Tsar because uh, he had certain protection from Tsar interfering he had some autonomy uh, internally and locally with the place where he lived so I'm just saying that medieval ages are not exactly as uh, bad as Putin is uh, being drawn out to be um, now all these talking of talk about going to European Union all the nods that yes will take you these are some payments for that symbolic capital that we with a symbolic coin that we acquired by being essentially the shield from Putin's aggression and lately there is more conversation finally showing up that even Poland and Germany are saying that if we do not stop Putin and Ukraine we might have to face that conflict physically ourselves and I frankly though do not think Putin will really go with the actual hot conflict towards Europe he'll probably use the same urban scheme and establish uh, special relations right with money those uh, yeah who are listening at the word of special relations Alexei indicated money with his fingers so I would say nothing indicates that we are going to be accepted to European Union and NATO besides very small nods and makes sense that uh, we maybe will be there and Ukraine is going towards NATO is not because it is promised a place there but because it has certain illusions which disallow it to make more realistic conclusions and the bad is not our urge to join Europe the bad is that we do not understand the current situation and we still dream because let's take European yes let's take European agriculture market if we come there with our agriculture we will have they will have serious issues because we probably will change the whole pricing structure and everything there what do you hear from Poland our immediate neighbor if we take Ukraine into European Union we will freeze their ability to sell their agriculture goods in EU for 20 years right so they have serious concerns and it's much easier for European countries to pump out white Europeans with good education good skills good religious and ethics um, instead of bringing the whole country and it's much easier for them to cherry pick the ones they like from the ones that can come all together come all together and the problem is that we're not acknowledging that in Ukraine because any leader who will say that he basically will bring a very sore point up to society that was building the system of mythology in the modern Ukraine look the formula of Ukraine's joining NATO and EU is a big war with Russia 
It also has uh, the other side. Acceptance of Ukraine into European Union and NATO also means a big war, potentially, for Europe with Russia. And now ask yourself, are they ready to fight a big war with Russia to allow Ukraine to be part of them? And the answer you'll find is probably they are not ready to even fight with the hands of Ukraine, because we can see how many Atacams, for example, are being destroyed and dismantled without even being transferred to Ukraine, right? They're not even ready to pay us for the big war with Russia, to help us fully. And they're much less ready to pay with their own lives, their soldiers, their territories, to have Ukraine part of them. So we just, in my mind, need to understand that and do accordingly. For example, South Korea, Israel and Azerbaijan are not members of NATO and EU, and they're doing all right. We, however, have that goal of joining, and we built that unrealistic vector as a backbone of our government politics. So why are we surprised that the results of our politics are rather illusory? It is a colossal mistake in my view, and I'm looking at my compatriots, and I know all of them, these politicians, I know them in person. I know most of Ukrainian experts personally. I know all these discussions, and I look at these kind people and think, are they dumb? just not smart, or the tape in their head is still playing one song and they cannot change it, which is also a sign of not being too bright. Because EU and NATO, EU and NATO, EU and NATO is a main motive out there. And they don't even bring a very basic analysis into the framework. So how our motion towards NATO plays with the fact that Americans are going to utilize to destroy and dismantle the HIMARS systems instead of sending them here. Alexei, I'll find you an answer. You are a Moscow agent spreading Moscow narrative, and just two days from tomorrow, Americans will change their mind and give everything. Right, exactly, Yulia. And uh, the only thing is that they, they are still giving us tanks for over a year and a half. While tank, you know, is a much uh, more modest weapon. It cannot reach targets on the territory of Russia, thousand miles away. It cannot destroy refinery, it cannot destroy their training facilities for military. But, uh, you know, Komsomol and uh, party members cannot just change their course of going to NATO, because if they officially acknowledge that, they'll lose all the subscribers and likes, right? Alexei, this is like going to God's heaven, right? God's kingdom. Yeah, exactly, and we're walking towards that, we're trying to march there. And they are very similar in this regard. There are some Americans here who believe America is that America is the shining city on the hill. And fortunately, we have people in our politics who believe America is the shining city on the hill. And the fact that it keeps dumping on us as the possible ally and partner, that just, you know, minutia that needs to be disregarded. And if we pretend to be smart people who can understand consequences and the concept of that we are facing an interesting proposition that ukraine with 500,000 people on the front mobilized and fighting with their lives they need to pay that's the price we need to pay for our analysts and politicians still singing the same song about european union and nato which are probably never going to happen you know, that reminds me when they were driving in Moscow with American flags and uh, pro-Trump slogan saying, hey, we elected Trump, until they realized a bit later that he's not doing anything for Moscow. So, the same thing here. We are pretending to be marching to EU. We're actually very excited about that, but we're not looking into analysis why and how, and is there any progress in that and there are two shining cities on the hill for Ukrainian, European Union and NATO. And these two shining cities are showing us uh, F off gesture for quite a while. And we disregarding also the fact that they're also, you know, still have not standardized a lot of things in Europe. They are very discombobulated in this regard. They still have different electric plugs there. And I think it's to the level of insanity because there is neurosis, psychosis and madness and we are somewhere there madness and insanity not the vector itself but the fact that we're using it as the government politics and uh, as a empty hope that we will be taken in it's not so and i think we can build a country a strong country that can 
fight against Russian uh, attempts to annex it, that can be very successful. Look at Israel, they deal rather well. But no, we need to keep going to Washington and the EU. Well, okay, I guess we'll have to pay more with more lives for that idiotic aspiration. And unfortunately, this story can be played for a while. And probably in Turkey, that uh, is a candidate for EU since 2005, they might still have some politicians who are building their politics on uh, that vector of going to EU. And they probably also have analysts who are saying that everything against EU and NATO is a Kremlin interjection, right? And when you converse with people like that, because you bring some speakers here, ask them a question, how do you answer to destruction of Atacam systems. This will be a good litmus test for them. EU and NATO, special relations with the United States, right flank for NATO, we're defending the free world, and in the meantime, the free world is destroying Atacams instead of sending them to Ukraine. So these great fans and pillars of Ukrainian foreign politics, let them answer that question. I would say that I have not seen more lost and not understanding what's happening worse than Ukrainian leadership, than Ukrainian bureaucrats. I have not seen anywhere but in the leadership of EU and NATO. And I do understand a bit what people are. I have also a lot of different relations and communications. But in 2023, the most lost, the most lost of all orientation facing big problems are the ones who are the expert society of EU, NATO, and some of the United States. And I sincerely almost want to hug them, you know, and so I could keep their tears on my shoulder and then pat their heads and start doing a psychotherapy session. Because people in the organization where you really want so much, they're, you know, like in America, they're making movies about the Civil War. Um, Yulia, all that 2023 and that story, in my mind, shows us that even adults can behave like a little toddler in a supermarket who is throwing a hysteria in a store looking at the candy, and the wrapper has NATO and EU written all over it, and they can make it a basis for their public rhetoric, public politics, and the country vector. So for me, Ukraine will awake and will become the subject on the international political field and would say we are building our own Ukraine, we don't care about these organizations, we're not going to be part of that, we are building our own interests in our own country. That's when I think we'll grow up. Just like South Korea, just like Azerbaijan. You know, I had just a very provocative thought visit my mind, uh, but I need to ask you, I need to think it over a little bit, and I want to ask you a few more questions where over an hour we can transfer that to the next week, or we can still discuss some. Yeah, I can talk for another 15 minutes, if you like. Okay, then I would say the following. When you said that NATO is not an option on the horizon, and President Zelensky was told that by Biden several times, that was one of the main demands that Putin threw at Ukraine and Istanbul agreements, together with uh, limiting Ukrainian military force. So, what do you think? Should you have signed those Istanbul agreements? If so, why was not it signed? Yulia, I think it was not realistic to sign that. And, you know, the sign that tells me this is that easiness with which that situation, Russia against NATO and Russia against Ukraine turned into Global South against Global West. The speed with which uh, BRICS organization is now growing, where Ethiopia, Arab Emirates, Iran and other countries are joining, shows that anti-colonial discourse was very strong and everything was ready for that eventuality. So the problem is much bigger than Russia-Ukraine or Russia-NATO. That's why I doubt that those agreements could be signed but they were good agreements. 
Yeah, you were the one saying two or three weeks, exactly, because I was participant of that group and I knew when that was supposed to be signed. But you thought that it would be signed, right? Yeah, I not only thought, because right now you can hear some opinions that Russian group was uh, very ill-represented, Medinsky and some other characters, they, that was just a play for them. I want to say, fellas, you can think whatever you want, but I've seen the seriousness and real content of their delegation and how serious they were about signing it. So I think their not signing was predefined by destiny if you switch to a higher language, but if they were signed, that would, be, would have been a good solution to this conflict. So who do you think broke the signage of that? Russia or Ukraine? I think, Yulia, only three people know the answer to that. And the history will ask them, not me. Um, we came from Istanbul. We were ready to pour champagne. We actually had a perfect agreement where we discussed even the status of Crimea. Was it going back to the borders of 24th of February? It was limiting of Ukrainian army and it was not joining NATO, the main terms neutral status they wanted to shrink the army our president refused to do that that was the only question that was not regulated and Zelensky said that he will take care of that question personally if it comes to this and they were allowing it to be only 200,000 250,000 but uh, we needed a way to increase it in case of uh, conflict so he promised that he'll resolve it with uh, Putin eventually and I think it was the end of March when we were planning to sign that um, and Zelensky and Putin negotiations were maybe planned for a few months after. So, and we discussed the status of Crimea with them and they were ready to discuss it, really discuss it. They, I think we wrote it as 10 to 15 years for a slow process, but uh, the strength of that agreement was that we were closing Minsk 1 and Minsk 2 agreements. We were jumping out of the trap of those two. And Ukrainian military and Ukrainian people earned that right. That was a very good proposal. And in essence, we were going at that moment on the scenario of a Chinese-Vietnam War in the 70s of the last century, where they fought for six weeks and then they froze this war because it's not go it was not going as planned. And unfortunately, it was not in the stars to sign that. And I don't think it was just because someone was stubborn in the Ukrainian delegation. I think the sum of conflicts was much bigger than what we were addressing. Because otherwise, we would not see BRICS increasing so rapidly. And we would not see such a global speed of beefing up South versus Collective West. That basically is indicating that Putin's um, direction and attempt to capitalize on this angle was very proper and he saw these things already unfolding. Now, it doesn't say that this agreement would not have been beneficial, right? But I'm talking now about the vector. The vector of our politics is false. And there is nothing pro-Moscow. South Korea is not pro-Moscow, Azerbaijan is not pro-Moscow, Israel is not pro-Israel, pro-Moscow, they're pro-Israel. And we need to be likewise pro-Ukrainian. And EU and NATO, I don't think they'll ever take us as a member. I don't know what needs to happen to them in order for them to accept us, because the price that they will have to be ready for, to be ready to pay, is uh, a big war with Russia and they will never go for that. They cannot even answer for the missile that fell in Poland. They cannot provide any rough response to Russia for that. It's easier for them to negotiate, to trade off, to surrender, and so on. So that's my opinion. All right, and sorry that I'm going back again to Istanbul agreements once again, because on one hand, before and during Istanbul, at that moment, Russian army was seen as weak, and if Ukraine would be given enough arms, they were seen as capable of returning their territories back. Now, on the other hand, since that time, we have tens and thousands of people, tens of thousands and thousands, a hundred thousands of people dead since then. 
and you brought uh, an example, the war of China with Vietnam. I'm remembering a different one when Putin attacked Georgia. And in just a few days, Saakashvili preferred to surrender, uh, to acknowledge defeat. They lost some territory, but at least Georgia is still a country, still a separate entity. Because otherwise, if you didn't, Georgia would probably be completely occupied and Saakashvili would have been somewhere out in the West writing memoirs. But after that agreement, he completely lost his next elections because not a single democratic president, after losing the war like that, can remain a president. Yulia, so Zelensky was full of decisiveness to sign these agreements. So I don't think he was thinking about elections. And the conditions were rather good. You could actually play that back and say that as a stepping stone, as achievement, because the big enemy rolls back and is ready to review the status of Crimea, he could capitalize on that. So I don't think he broke those agreements because he had a sky-high rating, complete trust, and he could allow a lot of things as politician. I also don't think it was Treacherous Johnson who gave a, an order or something. Uh, even though he was present on the scene and he was uh, not for these agreements. But I think that some of all issues that we had at that time were not, was not able to be resolved by these agreements. So they were never to become true. Because we were falling quickly in the conflict of global south against the global west. And the contradictions in the world are much higher than those agreements could solve. All right, so we have some time for another question. And it is a rather strange question. It's connected with uh, Russian stage performance arts. Not exactly with them directly, but we just discussed that level of propaganda and PR on both sides has reached some really sky highs, and both sides are figuring out who is a Nazi, who is a fascist. And I don't know if our viewers know that, but one of the leaders of Russian charts is... Uh, taken by Ukrainian singer Anna Asti. She's uh, at the top of the Russian charts. And an amazing part of that story, she came to Russia in 2022, and she is leading in 22 and 23. She is singing about love, and there is, of course, not a single word about politics in her songs. She recently got Russian passport. And since she partook in that scandalously known nude party, and she is also now getting the blowback and some of her concerts are being cancelled. That's how I heard about her. But having the hat of a politician, having the hat of a military, having the hat of a psychologist, I want you to comment as a psychologist, what does that tell about both sides? That situation when during the war for life or death, between two chunks of ex-USSR, a girl who came from Ukraine, and she is not really being aided or anything by Russian authorities, leadership, because she basically is saying is she's anti-shaman. She sings nothing about politics. So after that new party, she gets some reprimand and all. All right, Yulia, let's come from afar. Vladimir Kuzmin, the singer whom I liked since my childhood, Back in the Perestroika times and 1989 or so, he was asked a question. Could you tell, please, uh, when everybody is singing the songs of the social protest, why are you still singing the things that you did? Don't you want to join that movement, join rock movement and some protest? And he said that he found his social protest in the fact that when everybody is singing about protest, I continue to sing about love. That's... Uh, why he got my respect. And there is an asymmetry of approaches in Russia and Ukraine. Russian approach is rather fixed. Ukrainians are not our enemies. Our enemies are Ukrainian nationalists and Bandera fans and some military. Otherwise, we have 10 million Ukrainians in Russia, we have grandmas from Ukrainian side, and we loved going there on vacation. This is one of the dominating ideas in Russia. Of course, there is a extreme wing that wants to fry Ukrainian babies and that are giddy at missile hitting the 
civilian structures and more deaths. But those idiots, there may be 5%, right? Uh, well, 10. Recent polling said that it's about 10. Used to be more, now it's probably 10 from 15. But, right, there are usually fewer of them. We have a different trend in Ukraine. We have a trend to push out everything Russian outside of Ukraine. And this is the dominating ideology, and many people who did not want to do that, they're just afraid to speak the truth. That incident with the uh, uh, teen boy singing songs of Viktor Tsui is uh, one of those criminal cases against me, because one of, I, I was one of the people who stepped in to protect him, to support him. And I get a lot of response from our Ukrainian compatriots, uh, saying that I'm sorry I cannot speak out as much as you do, but I appreciate your candor. That is a victory of two different ideologies, each one in their own country. Putin says Ukrainians are brothers, but their fans and nationalists are wrong. We're going to kill them all. Over here in Ukraine, we have a different one that says uh, every Russian is a bad Russian. Oh yeah, uh, Alexei, let me add here one more to Putin narrative thing is... Uh, when the bomb hits the civilian multi-story building, then that building immediately becomes the military target. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, one of the two ways of shooting, right? You can either shoot the bullseye or you can shoot somewhere and then draw the target around it. Exactly. Wherever, like in Syria, where Russia was bombing, wherever the bomb drops, there that's where the ISIS headquarters were. So, unfortunately for Ukraine, the policy that we that was marginal at the beginning is now fixed affixed as the public policy that's what we see which position is more advantageous historically obviously russian cultural position like that historically is more proper is better um, when arab countries are promising israel the second holocaust during their war with israel israel made a publication where they stated official statement, Arabs are not our enemies, and that was done during the actual hot phase when Jews were being burnt alive in the buses, on their marches towards Jerusalem. Israel published a statement saying, Arabs are friends, our enemies are some governments that are ruling our neighbor countries. So if we took that position, we would have been in a more advantageous place right now. We unfortunately took a different one. Oh yeah, unfortunately, uh, Alexei, in your relations with the West too, right? Because the West is very sensitive. Indeed, they are sensitive. But now we have to play on that chessboard. Whether it's good or bad, I think personally this is bad. I keep drawing a distinction difference. I have my share of grief from holding my position, but in general, I represent crypto powers in Ukraine. The nominating power is different. And what about in the army, Alexei? Oh, in the army it's different. It's uh, very diverse. There is a trend where people respect Zaluzhny, and Zaluzhny posts out in the open that he respects uh, Gerasimov and is reading his works. Right? Nobody attacks him that he's a Moscow file or a Moscow spy. Now imagine if I came out and said that I respect Gerasimov and I'm reading his papers. What headlines would you see in Telegram channels in 15 minutes and tomorrow in press? Zaluzhny can't do that. He can do that, he can read the enemy works. Everybody is different. There are different officers, different upbringing, and there is not a single unified trend in the army. And look, our soldiers, they try to take prisoners, right? They, t they yell at the Russian soldiers in the trench, come out, hands up, you'll stay alive. Our soldiers provide first aid, water, and help them get out. So the army fighting in the trenches, in mud, in blood, they understand the rules, the rules of the game, they're, the, the war game they're playing, right? And there are, of course, some excesses when, when somebody gets shot, but generally military treat each other, at least our side is trying to treat them with respect. Sometimes the interrogations are rough, that also happens at war, but overall, the treatment is rather humane, as much as it can be under the circumstance. And what about from the Russian side, Alexei? From the Russian side, this was different. In general, they do treat us much worse than we do. 
uh, torture executions uh, way higher than you ever find on the Ukrainian side. There is speaking of any gentleman like behavior. I know maybe one case in the two year lieu of this war. A friend of mine who is a doctor was providing first aid. He lifts his head up and sees Russian soldier pointing a rifle at him and asking a doctor. He nodded and the soldier just walked away. But that's one out of you know billions of cases that I hear daily well, from the beginning of this war. Well, Alexei, there was one more, right? In Kharkov, when the Russian young officer covered a Ukrainian woman with his body from Russian soldiers, right? So that's the second case we know. But we also saw how they cut the head off our soldier who was captured by Russians. We also saw how they execute our uh, soldiers when they capture them. In any case, it's uh, mostly people not on the front who are playing politics and scream stuff in the media, in the Telegram and social networks. I actually read a funny post by somebody from the front who says, I'm so tired of all that in the trench. I would love to go to Europe, sit there, drink coffee and post borders to the 1991, death to Russians, to the last soldier, etc., etc., etc. This is all very nice to do from Berlin, from Portugal, from Canada, from the United States. On the front line, there are different laws. And soldier usually treats another soldier more humane. But still, Russian propaganda did play a nasty trick on the Russian soldiers. It through a rather poisonous trend to Russian army and it is tempting that many of them can use this trend for them um, that they will be excused for whatever they do because they're fighting with fascists supposedly and this is a problem because our propaganda is also throwing the same stuff that there are orcs and pig dogs and all that stuff and there are no humans but our soldiers are somehow still holding I I think it appears that we definitely statistically are more often humane than not. And military, if you go higher up the command chain than generals, they treat it differently. They nod when there is professionalism and they giggle when there is none. It's more like a professional sportsman, professional boxer. But still, Zaluzhny allows himself to make statements that any other in Ukraine would be eaten alive for. Well, right, Alexei, because he is illusioning. He said we need mobilization in Ukraine, right? So, yeah, we can fixate the trend. And the trend is that overall vector of Russian propaganda is slightly corrected. They're saying a bit less that they're fighting with fascists. They're speaking more that we are defining in Russia between Ukrainians and nationalists and the fans of Bandera, which is a dangerous statement for Ukraine, dangerous flow, where they're going with this. And in Ukraine, everything Russian is bad. All these conversations with Latina, for example, in Russian are bad. Right, so, Alexei, this cultivating of hatred to your enemy is unfortunately something that unites both totalitarian and democratic societies. It's characteristic for both sides, but it is very not characteristic for professional army or knighthood. I would even say, Yulia, mostly democracy needs that. Because dem democracy needs to trick its populace into believing in certain things. So that's part of that propaganda. And the first episode of that can actually be traced not back to Franco, Prussian, or British, probably even British caricatures from Napoleon were first. But it was early on, it was only on the British Isles. As a trend, it probably got defined during Franco-Prussian War, and at large, it really was implemented in the American society when, in 1918, Wilson administration was looking for ways to engage American citizens to fight war, first war in Europe, First World War. And here, American propaganda worked for A+, telling how Germans uh, raping French girls, killing civilians. So many Americans conscribed to the army and went to Europe to fight this war. And this one actually was very well written in uh, many books now. And by the way, Alexei, I need to correct you here that I think the first story of that kind 
can be traced to Fukidid when uh, the Spartan leader is uh, saying a very winded speech about Persians, that they are barbarians because they cannot walk naked. They have unified system of measures and weights, and they are also paying taxes, so they are real barbarians. And this is all being said, right? This is a democracy. Yeah, this is a Plato's trap. You can be honest, smart, and use conscience with uh, Ellens with Ellens, and relations with barbarians and heathens got to be different. Those who don't believe, you can read the poem by Rudyard King Kipling, East and West, have heathens, have children. And all these uh, descriptors are about you and I. So I would say democracies need to barbarize their enemies more and turn them into the house pawns, because the main means of democracy is marketing, economic, political, and any other marketing. And this is a task to push your head a way of thinking in a certain direction. So I guess today's stream we can label as the stream about political marketing, that Ukraine set up their own political marketing and now has to follow with it. But I do want to mention here, there is a crypto movement in Ukraine and among the youth in Ukraine, Russian music, Russian rap music is rather popular. The TV series The Word of a Thug is very popular in Ukraine now too. And if you look even at the music charts, official music charts in Ukraine, you will find that in the top 20 there are quite a few Russian performers. So everything is not so one-sided, is not so simple. Yes, one could not come out in public in Ukraine and say, yes, I love listening to Russian music, because you'll probably face societal attacks and uh, societal executions, not those by enforcement agencies and all, but uh, especially by those who just turned, who started learning Ukrainian language. And usually you can find very scared Russian-speaking Ukrainians who now had to switch what they, the language they speak because uh, they were rather afraid and of the current situation and they want to follow the trends, they don't want to stick out. I have a friend from Odessa, he was born there, his family was there for over a hundred years and he was saying that Ukrainian language is the code of nation and you need to really switch from Russian to Ukrainian. And I did ask him, Guy, do you really, did you really put that Ukrainian shirt on purpose? So that if there is a picture of you and myself together, you could be telling everybody that you were telling Aristovich how to be proper Ukrainian. This guy was telling everybody about the advantages of Ukrainian. I like Ukrainian. I understand its advantages. It's a beautiful language. But in their case, it's really the gesture of conformism. When a human scared by a crowd fleeing for his life is not ready to stand his position, stand his ground, is uh, flipping and starting to hectically make decisions around. And that once again outlines that a lot of our compatriots on both sides of the border, in Russia and Ukraine, they are the same Soviet people. And the main strategy in Soviet Union was to adjust to the leadership trend, to mimic everything that the party tells you to mimic. And that's exactly what's happening now. We're kind of looking in Ukraine, the same collective uh, farms, same societal pressure on everybody who sticks out. And in Russia, it's the same way, just in a different, from a different angle. Oh yeah, Alexei, and American cancel culture can be spread thickly over that, because now it is allowed, because now it is also exist in existence in the West. Hooray, now we're not like those KGB officers in 1937 in Stalin's Russia executing their compatriots, but now we're like Harvard. And yeah, that's a good point, Yulia. That's why we also need to be bringing up that uh, so Sovietism has won everywhere. Do you know the joke that uh, currently is popular in Ukraine among the military? Yeah, no, I don't. The troops of Moscow, North Caucasus, and Western districts started their attack in the Western direction and were met and repelled by troops of Odessa, Kiev, and Kherson districts, and Belarus district troops are withdrawing from the fight for now, abstaining from the fight. 
So this is essentially yeah, a joke reflecting reality. It's two Soviet armies are fighting. This is a relaxation war on the backdrop of falling of a huge mighty empire with unclear and and the West is saying that two pieces of the old Soviet empire are fighting who are mostly supportive of Ukraine because they are in the right, they were attacked, but still we do want, right, Yulia, we do want gas to have at 15 cents a cubic foot. Yeah, and uh, they're very alike from the point of view of the West, and they don't want neither Russia nor Ukraine too close to them. And they understand also, Yulia, that uh, if they adopt Ukraine into their organizations, they might have to fight this war themselves then. And that's why they're seeing that, dear Soviet republics, you can fight, please carry on. But they are still helping, and uh, Alexei, and it is dictatorship in Russia and democracy in Ukraine, right? Well, right, kind of. That's true. So, Alexei, indeed, this is not comparable, I think. We can say that this is... We don't like these things in Ukraine, we don't like these trends and all, but this is completely incomparable with what's happening in Russia, with Yashin and Navalny, who get 10 years in prison for nothing for no crimes committed. Indeed, that's not comparable, but what would you say about Arestovich who was pushed out of the country and still cannot come back? For political reasons. Alexei, with the deep respect to you, we understand that there is still a big difference. Even if Ukraine is walking to a non-existent city on the hill that we've been poking at at the moment, they still want to go into the future. And Putin wants to go into the past. And even if Ukrainian democracy and we can talk a lot about its deficiencies and deficiencies of democracy in general, because democracies are structures that imply that politicians will be making short-term decisions that allow them to win in the next elections. Yes, Yulia, and they also lie, very purposely lie to their electors. Well, Alexei, I wouldn't agree here. They both lie. In Russia, they lie just as much. Right. Democracy, Yulia, is a system that allows politicians to fight, to put the white clothes on and say that they are fighting for democracy. But, Alexei, in order to see democracy, one needs to go to the dictatorship and to see the room is black and there is a dead body hanging on the wall. That will be a good difference between that and democracy. Yulia, I think this is a wrong dichotomy because... No, Alexei, Russia is fighting with Ukraine, that's why I'm comparing. No, Yulia, but what if they are not fighting? Right? Democracy doesn't need to be compared to authoritarian regime. It has its own values. And f frankly speaking, democracy can actually wage a war within itself on some level, which we may see in some capacity in the United States. But the discussion whether to lie or not to the electors was very active in 1910, 1920, and it was uh, concluded with the victor of the person who stated that, yes, it is also important to lie to electors. Oh, that's obvious, Alexei, because those who lie, those who deceive their voters, uh, get more voters, they usually prevail in elections, right? Yeah, so, you know, we can speak in the open about the deficiencies of democracy. We don't necessarily have to compare it with the worst. All right, well, then let's start with that comma next time. Why in a lot of democracies, Soviet system is taking root and winning. And we could have talked about it today. I left a few doors open, but you evaded that topic to discuss the others, which were not less important. Thank you, Alexei, this time. That was great, and we'll see you again.